Okay, so uh, hello everybody, hello dear guests. Um, um, my name is Alexandre Michi, I'm a cardiologist working uh, in Montluçon, France. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce to you this uh, webinar, um, which comes from uh, the working group on telecardiology from the ISFTH, uh, the International Society for, for Telecardiology and E-Medicine, which counts around 40,000 members. Um, so today uh, we have uh, very special invites and the title of the, our, our webinar is a Vulnerable Plaque. Uh, without delaying more uh, the introduction, uh, I have the pleasure to give the word to uh, our section chair uh, on interventional cardiology, Dr. Mirvat Alashnag. Um, hi, dear Mirvat, how are you? Hi, Alexandru, how are you? Very fine, thank you. <laughs> So, uh, dear Mervet, I, I, uh, I will let you introduce uh, our co-host uh, and, and then maybe uh, uh, present uh, our program for the, this evening. Thank you so much. Um, so, it's, it's absolutely a pleasure for me to uh, present Dr. Michelle Williams. I'm a particular fan of hers. She's a senior clinical uh, uh, lecturer and radiology consultant at the University of Edinburgh. And she's the president-elect of the British Society of Cardiovascular Imaging. And she's the member of the board of the directors of the Society of Cardiovascular CT. So thank you for um, making the time to be with us today, Michelle. Thank you very much indeed, Mervit. And thank you very much indeed, Alexandria, for uh, organizing today. Um, so there's some fantastic talks this evening. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. So, um, you know, I'm just very briefly, we're going to talk about the vulnerable plaque and kind of look at it from multiple perspectives. And um, it is absolutely a delight to have some of our imaging colleagues with us in this webinar um, to talk about the vulnerable plaque, how to evaluate it, what is in fact a vulnerable plaque and its clinical implications, and then how do we prevent and treat it. So without any further ado, uh, delay, I'm going to present our first speaker. He's a colleague of mine, Dr. Ahmed Al Jaziri. He's an assistant pro professor of cardiology and a consult consultant cardiologist and cardiac imager at King Abdul Aziz Cardiac Center in Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. He's also the chairman uh, of the, uh, the uh, imaging working group of the Saudi Heart Association. So Dr. Ahmed, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. al Asnaj, Dr. Mitchi, Dr. Williams. It's a real privilege to be among this elite group of uh, speakers to talk about the role of nuclear imaging in detecting a vulnerable coronary plaque. I have no disclosure. Now, the main goal, <clears throat> sorry, the main goal of management of any patient with coronary artery disease revolves around one major um, aim, which is reduction in major cardiac adverse effect, including cardiac death and non-fatal myocardial infarction. And that's probably why the first uh, and probably action is to classify patients into those with acute coronary syndrome who are uh, thought to have higher incidence of uh, these adverse cardiac events and those with a stable coronary artery disease. And among those with a stable coronary artery disease, the lesions are further classified to obstructive and non-obstructive lesions. The traditional teaching is that obstructive lesions are more likely to cause trouble, but <clears throat> history has proven otherwise, has proven otherwise. A lot of data support the fact that most of the lesion of the acute myocardial infarction and cardiac events actually happens in non-obstructive lesions. And these are the data from both PROMIS trial and ECONIC trial. In the CT arm of the PROMIS trial, it was found that 77% 77 of lesions less than 50% were associated with acute myocardial infarction. And likewise, 75% of lesions less than 50% uh, stenosis was also associated with myocardial infarction and cardiac death in my iconic um, uh, study. Um, this probably tells us that probably there are something else other than the stenosis itself that may cause the trouble, which has which was also been kind of signaled of this elegant uh, paper of 300, uh, 3,500 patients who uh, were followed up for 3.6 years. And interesting enough, if from this data, it's, it's likely that not only the the um, degree of obstruction, but the extent of the disease that may contribute to the outcome. As you can see here, patients with non-obstructive diffuse disease, 
of similar outcome to those patients with obstructive uh, limited disease with obstructive diffuse disease having the higher effect. What makes things even more interesting is that around 40% of black rupture does not result in acute coronary syndrome. And therefore, there may be something else other than the lesion itself, the, the degree of stenosis or um, its distribution that cause a black to be of high risk and result in adverse cardiac event. And this is where the concept vulnerable coronary black came up, came out from. And the idea is that those black are generally have a thin fibrous cap, have lipid core, necrotic lipid core, large necrotic lipid core, nodular calcification with micromineralization, and they have ongoing inflammation and new, uh, and new, genesis, uh, new angiogenesis. And these are basically the factors which make any coronary black vulnerable and likely to result in acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction. And as you can see, non-invasive imaging as well as invasive imaging can play a major role in identification of these features in order to further risk stratify patient and treat them. When it comes to how can we image vulnerable black, uh, we can do that with invasive assessment including intravascular ultrasound, op optical coherent tomography, near-infrared fluorescence, near-infrared spectroscopy, and finally, time-resolved fluorescence spectro uh, spectroscopy. However, in non-invasive arm, we can do that with cardiac CTA, a CTA looking at the features or anatomical features of any of the, of the black within the coronary tree. We can do that with functional metabolic imaging with positron emission tomography nuclear imaging, and we could we can do that with assessment of ongoing inflammation by uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. This is a schematic uh, presentation of a plaque that's thought to be vulnerable. And as you can see, these are the um, effect of um, vulnerability, including a thin fibrous cap, the micromineralization, the ongoing inflammation, and along them, a lots of names of radio tracer that can be used in order to assess the presence as well as the extent of these um, processes. However, um, among all of these, very few are now in the clinical use, including F18, um, FDG, as well as F18 uh, sodium fluoride. And the next um, five minutes, I'm gonna talk about the role of each of these in identification of ongoing inflammation and micromineralization that can attribute um, to the uh, vulnerability of the black. Let's just start talking about um, imaging with uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. Um, as you, we all know, um, FDG is a radio labeled glucose analog. It has a half-life of 110 minutes. And it is uh, interesting that it is, has a selective uptake by inflamed macrophages. And once it's, take, it's taken by incram, uh, inflamed macrophages, it remains trapped within the cell because it cannot undergo glycolysis because it lacks the uh, gly glycosyl uh, group. And interesting enough, which is make it very interesting for us, is that it accumulates in within the cells in a proportion to metabolic demands, which makes it a very attractive tool in evaluation of uh, inflammation, not only within a black, but uh, anywhere um, in the body. Imaging doses usually in the neighborhood between 85 to 300 megabacterial. Recommended circulation time before we image the patient is usually two to three hours, which is slightly longer than that time um, we used for imaging a patient with uh, cancer. However, I have to remember that um, my, the, my, there are there is a physiological uptake of cardiac myocytes um, with a, of glucose. And therefore we have to prepare the patient in a certain way in order to get the inflammation, um, in order to get accurate assessment of the inflammation. And that's usually happened by suppression of the physiological um, uh, uptake uh, of, uh, of cardiac myocytes by uh, shifting the metabolism to free fatty acid through a dietary preparation that include high fat, low carbohydrate diet, for 24 hours preceding the uh, imaging, we followed up by a prolonged fasting of 15 hours or more. And then we usually give heparin prior to imaging in order to um, facilitate the uptake of um, FDG by inflamed uh, myocytes. 
Interesting enough, when this has been attributed to patients with acute coronary syndrome, it was found that 60% of black associated with acute coronary syndrome has increased uh, FDG uptake compared to only 14% of stable coronary artery disease black. And this is um, a representation of three patients with LAD, ST segment elevation MI, RCA, ST segment elevation MI, and LCCX, ST segment elevation MI, showing increased uptake within the culprit um, uh, plaque, but not the other plaque. Not only this, but it has been shown that e even with stinting, the uptake is usually increased in a patient who have acute coronary uh, in, in lesion who had been stented for acute coronary syndrome compared to those stent, uh, stable lesion stented recently or remotely, and therefore it may help to identify those um, plaques at higher inflammation. However, it, is, um, it has its own advantages and disadvantages. It is highly reproducible. Uh, it can be, therefore, it can be used in longitudinal follow-up uh, of patient. It can identify black changes um, in black regression, probably from animal studies, and we are looking forward to see how this will pan out in patients with um, in, in human studies. It can be used for serial imaging of medication effect, and it has been used for small studies with very short follow-up uh, in patient uh, treated with a statin. However, all of these studies has been small prospective uh, studies, very short follow-up, and there was always this sp limited spatial resolution to other modalities such as invasive modalities and CT, and of course, associated radiation, albeit not as um, uh, bad as the other uh, form of uh, SPECT imaging. What about sodium fluoride? F18 sodium fluoride is a radio-labeled uh, sodium atom. Again, it has a half, a long half-life of 110 minutes. It is actually initially um, was discovered incidentally uh, by imaging of, uh, it's, it's initially used to image the bone um, and incidentally found to show uh, uptake within uh, the uh, um, coronary, coronary arteries and uh, valve, particularly aortic uh, valve, and um, it has been attributed uh, to the uh, activity of micro calcification that happened within the coronary plaque, increasing the shear forces within the plaque and probably making it more likely to rupture. Uh, imaging doses usually in the neighborhood of five, five megabacterial per uh, body weight, and the imaging is usually uh, performed 60 to 75 minutes after um, putting the um, after administration of radioactive uh, isotope. The, as I said, the initial observation uh, from bone studies shown that those patients with coronary artery disease usually have high uh, sodium fluoride activity, but not that those with um, no coronary artery disease. It's interesting enough that the sodium fluoride activity is only seen in the culprit plaque. And most of the patient with calcium score of more than 1,000, which indicate chronicity, and probably more of a healing process rather than active inflammation, usually have no sodium fluoride activity. We have one large prospective uh, study, which included 80 patients, 40 of whom were, uh, have acute coronary syndrome, including 26 ST segment elevation MI and 14 non ST segment elevation MI. And in this group of patients, higher um, uptake was seen in 93% of the, uh, uh, of the group, and not only this, but the culprit legion have significantly higher uptake of more than 35% uh, compared to non-culprit legion. When it comes to the 40 uh, patients who have chronic stable coronary artery disease, only half of them had uptake, and interesting enough, in those half that have high uptake have demonstrated high adverse black features on IFAS, including micro um, calcification, positive remodeling, as well as um, uh, necrotic uh, core. This is an um, example of two patients. The first patient is a patient who presented with ST segment elevation MI and was found to have totally occluded LAD. After stinting, you can see there is an increased uptake within the LAD, um, uh, LAD um, uh, uh, area, with, which was the culprit, but there was no activity elsewhere. This is another example of anterior patient with anterior MI who had other, uh, also significant uh, left circumflex coronary artery. As you can see, the left circumflex coronary artery, which, always, which also has been stented, did not have an activity 
but the activity was only seen in the LAD, which was the culprit. Uh, um, so it is has a, a special predilection to a, a, a special. Um, it has increased only in the culprit region, but culprit region, but not uh, non-culprit uh, region. So what is the advantages and disadvantages of sodium fluoride? It has a superior um, activity and detection compared to uh, uh, FDG. It has no myocardial uptake, so it does not need requiretry. It does not require dietary preparation. However, it has long imaging uh, time per imaging pad of the body. It has also, again, limited spatial resolution and associated uh, radiation. So in conclusion, a nuclear imaging provides a promising tool in identification, not only vulnerable black, but probably vulnerable um, uh, patients looking at all the inflammation within the coronary vascular tree. Um, I think it will have a major role in the future in follow-up of diseases and monitoring of medical uh, therapy. Um, however, the uh, prognostic role of black imaging is still to be validated by larger studies with longer follow-up and what to do if we see these patients and how we move forward is still to be um, identified. And with this, I, I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Amit, for a fantastic talk all about where nuclear uh, imaging can really help us identify and understand these plaques. I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who's Dr. Andrew Choi, who's an associate professor and co-director of Cardiac CT at George Washington University in Washington in the USA. He's also a member of the board of the directors of the Society of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Michelle, uh, and I'm honored to join this distinguished panel here today to discuss this topic. And I want to thank uh, uh, Alex and Mervat for their leadership of this symposium. Uh, so I'm going to discuss uh, CT imaging for the vulnerable plaque, uh, and there will be some, I think, some nice compliments to Dr. Ahmed's excellent talk. Uh, these are my disclosures. You know, the first thing that I would raise is, you know, in 2021, are we talking now about individual vulnerable plaques versus high-risk plaques? Or really should the question be not around the individual plaque, but about high-risk plaque burden? And I'm going to discuss uh, this concept over the course of a very broad topic in the next about 10 minutes. Uh, and the reason we care is a patient like this, uh, this is a 39-year-old patient a very healthy athletic sports coach who had presented on the sports field with sudden death. He had no past medical history. He had no family history of sudden death. He actually had normal top line lipids, but uh, we had done imaging looking for an anomalous coronary artery and found that he had acute plaque rupture from a uh, high risk non-calcified plaque, uh, positively remodeled plaque that uh, required PCI. And so the question is, how can we best identify this kind of a patient um, and really save lives? Well, when it comes to CT, as you heard in the first talk, it provides a comprehensive cardiac assessment, coronaries, cardiac function, myocardium, pericardium, as well as uh, unique plaque assessment and inflammatory features. CT can be now done at very low radiation doses and also done at low cost around the world. What are the goals for CT-minded high-risk plaque evaluation? First, it's to characterize and assess the atherosclerotic burden non-invasively. Second, we want to identify how adverse plaque characteristics can influence risk and outcomes. And third, uh, as will be discussed also later on in the symposium, is to understand how targeted therapies can improve outcomes. And I want to point our, our, our uh, uh, viewers to the SCCT atherosclerosis guideline that was just published last year, which Dr. Williams is also a, is a co-author. Now, uh, there are, have been traditionally a number of invasive approaches to high-risk plaque, as Dr. Ahmed talked on, including IVIS and OCT as well. And, and shown here are uh, fi the findings of the carotid core and also the thin cap fiber atheroma that we're trying to identify uh, through these imaging modalities. Um, and when we come to non-invasive and CT imaging, now I want to point folks to this paper that you probably know from Motoyoma and Jagat Narula, and really coining the term high-risk plaque, which is both a blessing for us and also it's something that has stuck uh, throughout. Uh, and what they did was to look at patients that had 
uh, undergone CT angiography that later developed acute coronary syndromes and went back and tried, you know, very painstaking work to identify what were the features on these angiograms that were pre, uh, predisposing people to develop acute coronary syndromes. And what they found and what they coined and identified was one, the presence of positive remodeling um, that correlates back to the Glagoff hypothesis in the 80s that vessels remodel will get larger to maintain lumen diameter as plaque builds up. And second, the presence of low attenuation plaque or plaque with a low Hounsfeld density uh, that correlates to, uh, uh, to uh, at-risk plaque rupture. Uh, uh, and so, and subsequent to that, uh, Amadi and also Narula have, have proven non-invasively and has shown in the first talk that it's not necessarily the severe stenotic plaque that will rupture, but that it's the non-obstructive plaque uh, that will, uh, that may progress rapidly over, uh, even over a few months and that will acutely rupture uh, and cause an acute coronary syndrome. What are the things that we look for on CTA uh, to correlate to histology? Uh, plaque volume, this necrotic core, which uh, it presents as low attenuation, low density plaque, positive remodeling. It's been defined classically as you know, 1.05 or 1.1 compared to a reference vessel. The presence of a napkin ring sign, uh, which um, correlates to a thin fibrous cap necrotic core. Presence of spotty calcifications in the plaque that are high risk plaque, and that differentiates it from the very stable, uh, high, uh, hounds, high density plaque that I'll show in just a moment. Uh, and then also the presence of uh, perivascular coronary inflammation, as Professor Hyde will uh, touch upon in this session. And so, what we've learned about atherosclerosis, and this is from a JAG paper we published uh, with NIH last year, is that the progression of atherosclerosis uh, from those that have no coronary disease uh, is on a spectrum that perhaps, you know, is in a psoriasis cohort, uh, especially that early inflamed plaque can be picked up by perivascular fat attenuation. And that then we really find in, in the majority in the sweet spot of patients with non calcified plaque that's rupture prone. Um, and that it will stabilize over time, become calcified plaque, and that perhaps we can also use CT angiography to identify hemodynamic features like fractional flow reserve and wall shear stress. We've learned uh, from uh, Dr. Williams' group and the Scott Hart group that if we can identify plaque, we can target treatment and have a significant effect um, with a 40% reduction in death and myocardial infarction at five years. Uh, and that it, it, uh, one of the important predictors, especially in stable chest pain, like in Scott Hart, is the identification of these high-risk plaque markers like positive remodeling and low attenuation plaque. And you can see that um, based on the analysis and sub-analysis of the Scott Hart trial, that the risk of non-fatal or fatal MI really goes up uh, significantly for those patients that have these adverse plaque features. Uh, and this has been shown in, acute, in an acute chest pain population. This is from Maros Forensic uh, and colleagues at MGH at Mass General, that while stenosis remains an important predictor and probably the most important predictor, um, that in addition, the presence of high-risk plaque features independent of obstructive stenosis is predictive of acute coronary syndrome in an acute chest pain population. Um, this is extended also to say that plaque has a sex-specific signature and uh, as Dr. Williams and others and colleagues, Dr. Leslie Shaw have shown throughout numerous papers and also the SECT 2018 guideline is that women in general tend to have smaller coronaries um, and have small plaque volume. But when you look at the ratio of coronary to myocardial mass, um, that this, uh, this difference between women and men may uh, portend the presence of both uh, uh, chest pain, uh, ischemia, but also um, uh, contributes to uh, really a sex differentiated risk of adverse events based on this uh, very, uh, very uh, different kind of plaque signature. Now we've uh, shown uh, and the field has shown that uh, plaque identification will allow for event prediction and enhanced prevention. Um, and where is the field going in the future? And so going from not only the vulnerable plaque or high-risk plaque, but really the quantitative plaque burden, how can we best assess whole heart atherosclerosis and how will this next era of imaging incorporate this information and how will we use even machine learning to individualize patient management and to improve outcomes? Now doing this at present is time consuming and does require high expertise. Um, and so, but there's a lot of things that we can use CT for beyond stenosis and beyond plaque. We can look at eccentricity. 
We can look at the direction of the plaque, diffuseness, the plaque composition, the presence of necrotic core, the amount of remodeling, the amount of myocardium at risk, and we can put this all together and really individualize the risk. The aforementioned ICONIC trial does this. Now, it does quantitative atherosclerotic plaque evaluation, uses the confirmed registry of 25,000 patients and does a case control, takes patients that have acute coronary syndrome, uh, uh, matches them by these uh, factors shown here, including age, gender, and risk factors. And what they find is that uh, confirm one, what we've known from prior invasive studies and as shown in the first talk is that uh, most heart attacks occur in patients that have previously mild plaque. So as shown in the green here, less than 50% stenosis. Um, and both on a per patient basis and on a culprit lesion basis. Um, and what we also learned from ICONIC is that uh, we can stratify plaque uh, on CT based on the densities as necrotic core less than 30 and that this necrotic core tends to be pathologic. On the other end of the plaque scale, that the calcified plaque and particularly as coined last year in JAMA cardiology, the 1K plaque, the density of over a thousand um, is, uh, looks to be very protective uh, for patients, and perhaps it's an effect of also statin therapy um, that, that does that. And so um, we, we've learned uh, through ICONIC and other trials that, um, that high-risk plaque that's non-obstructive can have a significant or similar prognosis to obstructive patients if we uh, look at the entire uh, plaque burden. Um, and as a closing point, and this is a short talk, is to ask now how can AI enhance our ability to prevent heart attacks and identify plaque when we think about all of us here in this session you know the average imaging specialist may read a billion pixels per day and the amount of healthcare data that's uh, generated each year is 153 exabytes a year and to put that in context five exabytes a year is all the words ever spoken by human and to do whole heart uh, plaque analysis by most uh, vendors, uh, you know, maybe six to eight hours uh, and maybe very time consuming require high expertise. Uh, this is a study that we've recently published using artificial intelligence, a uh, novel artificial intelligence based approach to evaluate um, AI guided stenosis as well as atherosclerosis. And we found that there was very high accuracy for stenosis evaluation um, and using AI to do full uh, automated segmentation and plaque analysis it can identify a wide range of atherosclerosis and further validation on this is taking place against IBIS, OCT, and uh, NERS as described uh, previously. Uh, uh, I think the future is uh, for treatment is CT-guided atherosclerosis treatment and um, both uh, 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 risk stratifying people by plaque and thinking about um, how we can personalize treatment and also think about disease progression, medication response, and who will benefit from invasive procedures. To close, this is a short talk. I want to just point people and invite people to come to SCCT 2021, which is in two weeks. And there will be multiple sessions discussing plaque evaluation and workflow, effective novel therapies, and AI. And so to conclude, you know, high-risk plaque is associated with ACS and acute stable chest pain. It's sex-specific. Uh, with these plaque features like uh, plaque burden, low attenuation, and positive remodeling. CT allows for whole heart atherosclerosis evaluation. Um, there is uh, some modest variability by visual assessment, and I believe that the future paradigm for prevention will incorporate atherosclerosis evaluation, and this may include AI-based approaches. Thank you for your time. So as always, superb um, presentation, uh, Andrew. So it gives me great pleasure to present our next speaker, Dr. Tom Hyde. He's a consultant interventional cardiologist at Great Western Hospital, Swindon, uh, with an interest in CT for uh, screening and tailored prevention. And actually, it was his discussions that sparked uh, the uh, preparation for this uh, webinar here. So Tom, over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. And um, yeah, but the idea for this this talk really came from a, a Twitter chat, uh, sharing a case uh, with permission. Uh, and I've been um, screening patients uh, in a very careful way uh, for over 10 years now uh, as part of my work uh, privately. And it come up with questions sometime and you see a lot of patients, you see a lot of CTs. And we just came up with this question, well, when, when does subclinical atherosclerosis become a disease? 
And it was just a question that, that, that raises more questions. And this is the dictionary definition of disease. And these definitions came about eons ago, really, when, when disease was defined by signs and symptoms. Now, I've just seen from Andrew that, the, and um, Ahmed, the world's more sophisticated than that. We can detect a lot more these days than, than just with our hands or, or with our ears. Um, and really, that in the modern world, a demarcation between disease and health is not, not always obvious. Um, atherosclerosis, we've heard about, we've seen some slides about, it's common. I mean, my approach is it's part of the human condition. Some people have more of it than others, but I'm sure we all probably have a little bit of lipid somewhere in our arterial tree. Um, it particularly affects the coronaries, as we know. Uh, it's a process where lipid enters uh, through the endothelium into the intima. Uh, there are the traditional risk factors for developing atherosclerosis. Um, it's progressive, it's inflammatory, it leads to a large lipid core, uh, and the lipid core can uh, act on the uh, intimate media leading to acute plaque events, so acute coronary syndromes, with plaque rupture or plaque fissuring, or the plaques can progress to a degree where they um, obstruct the lumen and lead to symptoms. Um, now, it is actually defined as different stages histopathologically. Uh, this is really from sort of early post-mortem work, but the, the, the stages of plaque go from uh, stage one to stage six. Um, I, I was very interested the other day, I read a prevention article that was suggesting that that secondary prevention should start when you detect a type four lesion. And my, my view is always secondary prevention is after you've got a disease rather than you've, you've found a lesion. And they suggested tertiary prevention should happen after you've had an event. So it's all a bit mixed up uh, because we're certainly detecting type four, type five atheromas uh, in asymptomatic patients on a regular basis. And they do not have a classical disease that we define as, as angina or a myocardial infarction. So how prevalent is subclinical atherosclerosis? Well, it depends on the sample that you, you've looked at. It depends on the, the um, measure you use. Most big, big studies, and I know Andrew referred to CONFIRM, which is a, a sort of global initiative with lots of different groups, but the biggest recent studies looking in well asymptomatic patients uh, find uh, high levels of calcium in you know, 30, 40, up to 60% of people well, 60% of people in, in Holland, which is the Rabinska trial, had some calcium. Scapus is in Scandinavia, uh, quite a lot of calcium there. They did CTCA, so any plaque in 42% of your typical Scandinavian. So the, the big question is, well, whose plaque is going to have a problem? Uh, when is it going to have a problem? And we're just on the right-hand side here, just showing again what Andrew touched on, that, that women have less calcium than, than men. So the blue bars represent zero calcium. Uh, and there are three big studies here. The Robinska is the largest one from Holland. There's Mesa from the US and the Heinz Nixdorf recall study from Germany. So there's a, there's a lot of atherosclerosis about, but actually, do you know, when we looked at the mummies from ancient Egypt, 32% of mummies had evidence of atherosclerosis and they died on average age 36. So it's been here forever. It's been here forever, but now we've got the, the tools to, to find out who might have an event. And uh, we've got the preventative tools as well. And the, there is a bit of overlap between what Andrew said, but what's the point in detecting it? What's the point? The point is to, people wanna know what their prognosis is. They wanna know if anything could be done to, to prevent it. And for certain people, they have to have these scans because of their occupation. So if you're an astronaut or a fast jet pilot, you're in charge of a lot of equipment, expensive equipment, and you have to for your occupation. And I have read, indeed, presidents have to have CT scans as well. Um, so in terms of screening itself, opportunistic screening is generally what, what I practicing in, 
uh, and that's based on belief. At, at the moment, we don't have the full, full evidence to show that screening patients with CTCA leads to, to uh, hard uh, benefits of well patients who, who, who do not have disease. Um, so the big question was, at what point does it become disease? And uh, there was a physicist called Schrodinger who set up a thought experiment um, about a cat and a radioisotope. And essentially, the cat can be alive and dead at the same time. So subclinical atherosis can be, can be disease. And I'll highlight that with the case. It also obviously becomes disease when angina occurs or when somebody has a heart attack. Um, so this is the Schrodinger case. This is a... Uh, Fit, healthy male coming for a screening visit, single risk factor, no symptoms, lipid profile is, is fine. And he undergoes the screening CTCA after careful counselling and it's demonstrated here with widespread spotty calcification. And there's a lot of plaque in the uh, LAD, which looks hypodense. I don't have any of the fancy analyses that, that Andrew has, uh, but to me, this looked like a uh, a high risk case. So after discussion with the patient, we went on and did further imaging and a stress MRI was performed, which demonstrated a large burden of anterior ischemia and an infarction in the circumflex territory. So in my opinion, at this stage, he became uh, clinical. This was clinical disease, but it only was clinical after we'd looked with the MRI scan. He underwent a selective arteriogram and has had a successful uh, revascularization. So I think a lot of people would say he's probably avoided a heart attack. Next case uh, was 52 at the time. This was in 2012, busy life. Uh, wanted to come to for reassurance that everything was gonna be fine because he wanted to carry on working hard. Had a CTCA in May, which is the top image. Uh, Image quality is not perfect, but there's some uh, hypolucent plaque there. There's some calcium. I actually referred him to another cardiologist who recommended a further scan and then regular stress imaging on a two yearly basis. Now the advantage he had was he knew to look out for symptoms and he did develop symptoms in 2019 and sought prompt hospitalization where there was an elevated troponin and a uh, stent was placed in the LAD for a non-STEMI. So I guess the subclinical became clinical and that was seven years later. Now, what's interesting about, about his case is that we went back and looked at his uh, CT from 2012 using a technique called uh, fat attenuation index analysis. He's looking at the perivascular fat and uh, the red color is, is bad, suggesting that there's the fat's attenuated and uh, the area where they look most is in the right coronary artery. And it came out with a predicted risk at that stage at 12.8% risk of the next eight years. And he did come back recently this year for a scan with a niggle of chest pain. And it shows that that inflammation has settled and his risk has got better since uh, the original scan. So I suppose on the original scan, we could have picked him as very, very high risk for an event. Does it matter whether atherosclerosis is subclinical? Well, I think it really, really does for the individual because they're individuals, they're healthy individuals, want to stay well. They don't want to see themselves as patients with a disease. It does matter for their insurance, but I'm not sure it does. And we'll hopefully hear from Professor Ray later. For high-risk patients, I think they should still have the same prevention strategies, as much prevention as possible, lifestyle, um, stress management. It's about matching the prevention to the risk and predicting the risk accurately. Um, maybe some overlap with Andrew's talk, and Andrew's far, far more well-versed in, in machine learning and things, but there are some unmet needs for screening certainly for individuals, doctors that provide the screening. We get the scan, we see the patient, we see the lipids, but there are some you know, good computer things these days. I read about something called autoplaque that's been used that can help 
automatically count the plaque. The carry heart, which I've shown uh, from Caristo, looking at the fat, can also look at, look at risks. And machine learning is a better predictor of outcomes than uh, individual analysis. And, and combining the machine learning with the patient characteristics, giving a, a fairly rapid ability to tell the patient what their risk is. I'm sorry, I called them a patient. Tell the person what their risk is and what the benefit and risk of therapies were, will be is what, what um, I'm really looking for. And I think it will come in the future. Um, so just to conclude, I think subclinical atherosclerosis I've shown is very common. Uh, screening is happening and subclinical atherosclerosis is being detected. There, is, there are still uncertainties about whether screening is a net clinical benefit because the trials are ongoing and they take a long time to do with follow-up. Um, but I think we need better tools to identify prognosis and guide prevention. And I'm not sure whether it's relevant to give this demarcation between subclinical atherosclerosis and, and coronary disease for some people with high-risk plaque. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tom, for a fantastic talk. And it's a really important question. If we define disease as an abnormality in the structure or function of a human being, then atherosclerosis technically is a disease. It's just we need to change how we think about disease per se and uh, focusing on prevention um, rather than waiting for the symptoms of the myocardial infarction. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, Professor Karsik Ray from um, London in the UK. He's a professor of public health and a consultant cardiologist, director of the Imperial Center for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention, deputy director of the Imperial College uh, Clinical Trials Unit, and head of commercial trials at Imperial College London, and president of the European Atherosclerosis Society. Prof Ray is going to talk today about prevention and treatment of atherosclerosis. Thank you very much indeed. Great, thanks Michelle. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully that's working. You can all see that. Okay, so um, you've heard some very nice talks about personalized medicine and improving risk prediction and the accuracy of the way that we identify vulnerable individuals than, than, and those most likely to develop cardiovascular disease. Well, I'm gonna give you a slightly different approach and really talk a little bit more about population health. So these are a list of my disclosures. And what I want to really just point out, one of the real challenges, I mean, there's no way I can cover everything in 12 minutes because cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis is multifactorial, which means we have to basically treat all the exposures that, that we know lead to the development of atherosclerosis. But on, on the background of that is your genetic vulnerability. So we know that many people or the majority of people will develop cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events on the background of apparently okay levels of cholesterol. You know, if you look at the sweetheart data, 75% of people that come in with a myocardial infarction were, not, were statin naive. So either the healthcare system is failing them and they're not interacting and we're not trying to prevent disease, or we would have identified those people as low-risk individuals. So essentially, we're talking about disease prevention and the interaction between genetic vulnerability, which may be adaptive or maladaptive in a range of exposures. Now, the big thing that we actually forget is the duration of exposure. And that's really important because inevitably, all our risk prediction tools and scores and so forth end up with palliation in yellow on the right. So we end up aiming for people with more advanced disease rather than probably what prevention should be about, which is preserving health. And so if we think about atherosclerosis, it starts with the accumulation of APA-B containing lipoproteins, starts in the first decade of life, progresses in fits and spurts in different individuals determined by both exposure and genetic vulnerability. And as you've seen very nicely in some of the, the uh, diagrams that have been shown by previous speakers, that essentially the majority of these people are going to be asymptomatic until they present with their 
acute event. So let's think about, for example, and take the example of lipid lowering and, and in a bit blood pressure as well. So we know that cholesterol lowering works. And the blue line in the middle is the really famous average of the cholesterol treatment trial is all the statin trials put together. So there's no such thing as normal. If your cholesterol is lower than the person sitting next to you, your risk is going to be lower, all things being equal. And it's the absolute magnitude of that reduction that determines your benefit. The other key thing about this is the vertical axis, which is duration of exposure or duration of treatment. So when you start treatment with any, any lipid lowering therapy, in although the average over about four years or so in the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration is about one fifth reduction per millimole lowering of LDL, in the first year you get about half of that and you get more and more benefit over time. Now, if you take that to uh, a more extreme example, and this is what we did in the EAS group where we collated the world data and essentially you see difference in LDL and the vertical axis essentially shows you RCTs, average five years, observational studies, 12 years, and essentially genetic Mendelian randomization, 52 years of exposure. So if you look up vertically, a one millimole difference maintained over 50 years is giving you about a 50% relative risk reduction. Or alternatively, if I were to achieve, for example, a one third or one fifth millimole difference in LDL, but I maintain it for 50 years, I'm gonna get the same benefit as if I treat somebody with, for example, a statin later on in life with more advanced disease, when I'm actually going to need a much bigger reduction because I've just missed the last 52 years of exposure. So essentially what we practice largely a late diagnosis, missed years, more advanced clinical or subclinical disease. So let's take that to another extreme and look at lifetime exposures and probably the, the two most important ones, LDL and blood pressure. And we can mimic RCTs and look at naturally occurring differences in LDL and blood pressure. And you can see at the top that basically the group that have the lowest LDL and the lowest blood pressure have the lowest relative risk of cardiovascular disease over about 50 years. And if you basically standardize that for a 10 millimeter of mercury difference in uh, blood pressure and a one millimole difference in uh, LDL cholesterol, you get about an 80% relative risk reduction. And if you look at the background of, of different things, so we can see here, for example, the benefit is actually pretty constant of getting both of these down. But if you were to smoke, you get slightly less benefit. Again, reiterated the impact of stopping smoking, for example. If your BMI is high, you will get slightly less benefit. So again, that's that concept of residual risk and treating all factors. But what this tells you is that if we're able to think about risk much, much earlier and change that, that long-term life course earlier, modest reductions maintained for a long period of time will give us large benefits. So essentially you can summarize that by looking at, at, at blood pressure and LDL, and, it, and it's basically a log linear relationship in terms of risk. So there is no such thing as normal for blood pressure. Yes, if your blood pressure is a bit too low, you might keel over and feel dizzy, but we don't really have that issue with LDL cholesterol. So those are two important factors. Here you can basically see this, this key concept of changes early in life. Now, by changes early in life, we're not necessarily talking about medication. There are a lot of things that can be done with diet, lifestyle, maybe policy that change exposures, but you're going to have to do that very early and maintain it for a very long period of time. So the people, for example, now that are young, we may actually manage them very differently from all of these adults that we're talking about um, that are coming to see us later in life in our clinic. And to basically treat younger people, we only need about a one millimole difference to get 55% benefit over 50 years. But for older individuals, we're going to need much bigger reductions. So some of this nonsense about what's the inappropriate goal in, in somebody with established cardiovascular disease, you know, what's the evidence for 1.4 versus 1.8 versus 2.6 is somewhat mute if you're actually thinking about population health. If you go and then look at how we think about doing this pharmacologically, 
we do this with small molecules, meaning they have to be taken daily. And essentially, there's nothing magical about your cholesterol reduction. It's a function of what the doctor prescribes and what the patient does with that decision, whether they take the pill or not. So the biggest reductions in LDL are going to be when the patient is adherent and the doctor prescribes the right intensity of treatment. And that tracks exactly with risk. This is hazard ratio, the same two by two factorial relationship. So in the UK, for example, for every half a million people, there are about 12,000 avoidable events. If we were able to optimize um, prescribing and adherence. Now, one of the issues that we have is with lipid lowering, we're practicing a monotherapy-based approach. This was the Da Vinci registry. 84% of people in Europe, 2017, 2018, are receiving statin-based monotherapy. Now the goals have moved between 2016 and 2019. We've got lower targets in three categories. And that inevitably means that the monotherapy-based approach, combination therapy with azetamide or MABs is only used in nine and 1% respectively. We are only gonna be successful in one in three people in getting to goal. So the new mantra for LDL lowering has to be a bit more like blood pressure, which is combination therapy and not high intensity statins. And you can see that nicely in, in this slide where essentially the bold really shows you by stratification of background therapy, the, old, the proportion getting to the old 2016 goals. So that was an LDL of 1.8. Um, but if you, as soon as you move to 1.4, you're going to have to use combination therapy and probably greater use of therapies targeting PCSK9. Now, why is PCSK9 so important? Well, the main reason you lower uh, cholesterol, circulating cholesterol, is when you give medication like statins, is you make more LDL receptors. You increase the expression of those. And those receptors get internalized having bound cholesterol and recycled. PCSK9 breaks that or destroys those LDL receptors. So you, you don't get as much benefit. So it's actually really not rocket science. Make more, keep them alive. So any therapy that targets PCSK9 on a background of a therapy that makes more cholesterol receptors is going to be the most effective combination for bringing down circulating levels of LDL cholesterol. And the future, I suspect, is going to be with RNA-based therapies, because in, instead of working downstream and working less efficiently and targeting the protein, we can use nature's intrinsic process for switching off the message and thereby really acting at the top of the pyramid and therefore switching off the production of the protein with so-called sRNA-based technology. So we have now treatments that can be provided twice a year that will give you a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And this is obviously in people with established cardiovascular disease, high-risk primary prevention, but even in people with familial hypercholesterolemia who've got one normal gene and one uh, faulty gene, that one gene can be upregulated with a statin and made to do more work with a PCSK9 lowering therapy. And where I think we will eventually go is that if we're able to get these changes and changes early, the big impact, there is no difference between taking 365 pills a year, 26 injections a year, two injections a year with an sRNA. The big impact is adherence. And all you're changing is the area under the curve for any exposure. So over a five-year period of time, what sometimes looks like a modest benefit over 50 years is going to be a huge benefit for population health. So prevention really needs to start way earlier than we are right now. But that means maybe thinking about treatment or uh, policies that are acceptable, as well as better able to predict risk longer term. The main things that we can alter other than smoking, for example, and maintaining an adequate BMI is LDL and blood pressure and maintaining differences long term uh, and starting early. Late treatment with more advanced disease inevitably means you're going to have to use combination therapy. And really what I think that will change and help with issues such as adherence are the RNA based therapies. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That's a fantastic talk. And I think it's so important. Uh, starting early uh, gives us such a, a much uh, faster runway to preventing prevention rather than cure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that one of the key things about this is that we actually, um, when one of the issues with, with prevention is that, you know, we use these risk tools that are looking at 10 year risk. And the problem there is age. 
And because, you know, there's going to be very little that's going to happen to a young person. Um, and so thinking about the benefit of any treatment, because we don't have trials of 30, 40 years duration, you know, which is probably what we should be thinking about. And the second thing about it is, you know, if you were to say to a 20, I mean, OK, we do it with FH. We start treatment if we can identify them in the first, second decade of life. But if you were to do it to anybody else that is working and is active and looks and feels fine, the thought of taking 365 pills a year because a couple of exposures are high and we're jittery, they're going to laugh. So having treatment options that perhaps they find more acceptable, that are safe, that are convenient, will potentially be hugely influential in the future for population health. Yeah, by being realistic, I think. So we've got a few questions in on the um, question and answer session. So if you do have any questions for the speakers, do um, type them in uh, to the chat or the Q&A. The first one is for Amit. Um, can we use any of these novel nuclear techniques as screening tools for asymptomatic populations with risk factors? Um, thank you. I'd just like to thank the uh, speakers. It's really amazing the wealth of, of knowledge you come up with in this short time and with expert amazing talks for everybody great thank you so much now for the question now i think it is early uh, the use or the utility of um, nuclear imaging for vulnerable blackheads in early infancy uh, most of the time the patient comes with chest pain will probably result uh, resort either to cta or to nuclear scanning with the regular um, tracers that do not necessarily um, image the inflammation. However, I'm a strong believer in uh, opportunistic imaging. So for instance, if you have a patient who was sent, who was sent for nuclear imaging or for PET scan for cancer, and you see something in the nuclear, on the coronary area that is triggering inflammation, that's actually an opportunity to catch these patients and act on them. And likewise, if you're doing a bone scan for some reason and find them, then it probably will act on that. But I have to say, in that particular part, the CTA and regular perfusion scan take the, the lead. So yeah, probably the future may tell us more about this. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. It's not your go-to first line thing, but many patients who have cancer actually die of heart disease rather than their cancer. So if it's there, we should see if there's something that we can do um, from a prevention point of view. Um, the next question um, uh, I have actually for Andrew, um, Andrew Choi, um, when it comes to these vulnerable plaques on CT, they're so common. Um, many patients have them, but never go on to have heart attacks, whereas other patients have them and uh, uh, have a myocardial infarction and it causes extreme problems. So is there any way that we can divide these patients up or do we have to treat them all the same at the moment? Yeah, so right, you know, is the positive predictive value uh, high for this or not? And I think that's where, um, you know, we really uh, just really trying to pin down the specific plaque features. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's not that vulnerable plaque, it's really that plaque burden. And if we can quantitate it, um, then I think that's going to what is, that's what's going to help us to identify with better specificity, you know, who are the ones that are going to go on to have events or not. And, you know, we've been and I think we've also been thinking about, you know, this is a lot about prevention and disease. We've thought about, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Hyde is right on, you know, it's, you know, we've been thinking about it as a disease process and we really need to be thinking about it on the broader prevention spectrum and, and really thinking about that early plaque presence as, as not just, uh, not subclinical, but something that needs to be treated aggressively you know, so that we can really uh, prevent, you know, prevent in, you know, in the right patients and really being able to select out the right patients because all of our, uh, I think a lot of the clinical risk scores that we use are not very accurate. And even the, the concept of stenosis, you know, is, is not, uh, you know, can be improved upon, uh, improved upon as well. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot to be done. And, uh, you know, I also uh, add you know, Scott Hart too, uh, which will look at asymptomatic patients is going to really answer that question in the next 10 years. Yeah, we, we've learned a lot in the past 10 years, but there's going to be so much more to learn over the next 10. Um, a question for you, Tom, uh, in the chat here. Um, sh ha how should we consider um, calcium scoring in diabetic patients? Should that be part of screening for cardiovascular risk? Um, I think that's an interesting question. 
I don't. I just don't think the evidence is there yet. I, I've got a personal preference for CTCA over calcium score because I think the calcium score is a bit crude. Um, I would still think that some people have other risk factors. They could be smokers with a family history. And if they wanted to go for some opportunistic screening or the diabetologist was particularly worried, they can refer across. But I don't think it's a routine blanket thing. I wouldn't argue against it. I'm not saying we could recommend it for all diabetics at this point. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one. Around the world, lots of different tests are available. In the UK, we have ready access to CT coronary angiography and we're doing all the studies to look at in symptomatic and asymptomatic people that CT has gives you so much more information than just the calcium score. But around the world, sometimes that's what's available. Mervat, I could go on chatting to the panelists all day. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? All the panelists and all the speakers are just fantastic, a very... Uh, uh, fantastic talks and learning experience for me. Um, you know, I have very practical questions. So as an interventional cardiologist, whenever I get asymptomatic patients, my discussion is always the same. Um, I'm not going to prevent events by doing PCI if you're asymptomatic. Um, we now know from, from this discussion that anatomic definition, um, perhaps not just the epicardial coronary arteries, but actually looking at the plaque itself, can help us prevent. So treatment isn't necessarily a stent, like all us interventional cardiologists look at it. It can also be lipid management, blood pressure control, et cetera, et cetera. But my question here is, A, how do we convince asymptomatic patients that they need all these aggressive or perhaps expensive combined medications? That's question one to the whole panel. And the second one is very relevant to specific, because Tom mentioned it in his presentation, to specific occupations, so pilots, military personnel, etc. If you do anatomic definition, you, that you may end their career because a pilot is not going to fly if you don't address that plaque. And I mean address it immediately and not just address it by preventing an event later on. So how do we take it from here? Let me take the first part. That's a great question, uh, uh, Mervat. You know, you know, when we think about the plaque itself, um, you know, I think the paradigm people have is that you know, and it's a fair one. You have plaque, you put on a statin, and that's probably how most most of us practice in a day to day way. I think this paradigm is changing. You know, it's not just it's not that it's just plaque. There's the high, you know, if you have a high volume of low attenuation plaque, and you know, we're trying to really figure out what's the best system for people to describe that, um, versus, you know, if it's a lot of just cal, you know, high density calcium, you know, the risk spectrum is a little bit different. And then, you know, treatment right now goes beyond statin because you have statin, azetamide, PCSK9. You know, there's some effect of DOAC on plaque inhibition, benpo, uh, benpoic acid, fish oils. Um, uh, and so there's a number of treatments. And, you know, how do we now stratify all the different treatments, you know, to, to the different plaque types? And I think that's one of the things to work out. Um, so it, I think it's really refining and, um, you know, we'll have some maybe some new guidelines from SCCT soon. You know, on, on really pinning down, and I point to the atherosclerosis guideline too, on you know, if you have that really high risk plaque features that maybe intensifies your therapy um, and really, and, and then on a practical basis, you show people their disease, right? You show them, this is what you have. And I do this in the clinic that really, I think turns people and really gets them to take charge of their health, diet, exercise, as well as the, the therapies and prevention that we're talking about. Andrew, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to add to that if I can, Andrew, if, if you don't mind. And um, I totally, it's the seeing is believing. There's 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 people that would not go on a statin. And, and Kosha's point of, you know, of course it makes sense to get people on prevention age 12, 13, 14, 18, because they're not going to accumulate these plaques. But how do you convince an 18 year old to take a drug for life? It's going to be difficult. And so we can identify individuals at higher risk and persuade them to take this medication, but we don't know exactly who's going to pop a plaque. So I think we're doing better, but we, we can do even better. Afre, how do you handle specific populations, you know, pilots and so on? How would you 
And so I don't deal in, in terms of that side of things, in terms of um, occupational health, because obviously, I mean, it's got, as, as you said, huge implications. Um, I mean, in terms of risk, my I'm an epidemiologist, so I tend to think of quantitative risks and benefits. And most of the things I've tried to do is basically think about absolute numbers and try and explain that to people in a way that they can maybe relate to that enables them to make an informed decision. You know, if the only thing that's going to happen is that you're going to have 10 more birthdays and then suddenly you're across an arbitrary threshold, why delay 10 years? And visualization, most people, I mean, how was medicine kind of practice? If I go back to when I was you know, younger and we would think about just giving them medication X and we would say, yeah, it's been proven in trials to have a certain amount of benefit. And probably a long time ago, I started to get much more involved and interested in actually quantifying that. So, you know, my routine approach would be, for example, thinking about an estimate of 10 year risk, whatever the event rate is. And because we can do the math, LDL lowering, I can calculate how much relative risk reduction they're going to get and they can go down to a certain level. So, you know, a classic example was a 50, some 54 year old patient who has an incredible amount of coronary artery calcium and, uh, and he's had a lot more tests than most and his 10 year risk conventional scoring would have been about 7%. But using MESA, it's more like 20%. And so, you know, gradually with multiple add-on therapies, his 10-year risk would be estimated with new parameters down to under 6%. And that was something that he could actually relate to and how far he wanted to go. Should I go lower, doctor? And I, you know, I was able to demonstrate what it was and then actually do it and recalculate things. For other people um, who are young and you've got a and I'm using the example of a coronary artery calcium score, I find it really useful thinking about percentiles of risk. And the way I try to explain it is, look, you, your short-term risk is really low. However, you're on the 95th percentile. In a room of 100 women, you're going to be in the wrong five. And that isn't going to change because you're going to get older and you're going to still be in that part of the room. Now, if basically I change X and Y by this amount, by the time you hit your 10 birthdays on, you're now number 50 in the room. And if we did a bit more, you're now number 30. And some people relate to that and others you can tell them and they just don't want to listen and they ask to go into a trial, but they expect the active treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's what makes medicine interesting. Thank you so much. So I, I would have maybe a, a final question for Michelle. How would you see, Michelle, everything we talked about uh, related to tele, telemed, telemedicine and telecardiology? Uh, would you see any major break breakthrough in the following years regarding uh, what just has been discussed in our webinar? That's a fantastic question because everything about how we do medicine has changed over the past year or so. And we're now all embracing telemedicine, telecardiology, tele everything we do. Zoom is now normal and even my parents are using Zoom. And I think it's about communication, I think, is the really important thing. We don't just have to see people face to face. We can also show them pictures. They can, we can explain to them, um, like as it was saying, with what their, their individual disease looks like. And that communication does help the partnership between the doctors and the patients as to deciding what to do next and which treatments to take and which lifestyle activities to modify. So I think communication face to face doesn't have to be in person anymore and um, using the information from all of these different imaging modalities can really help that discussion with patients. So I, I think we should wrap up because uh, we are at the end of our webinar. Uh, I would like to thank to all of our audience. We had uh, around 550 subscribers today uh, with uh, a slightly lower attendance, uh, live attendance. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to, um, to send all of you my, my special uh, uh, thanks and regards. Thank you, dear Mirvet, Michelle, Tom, uh, Andrew, uh, Kosik and Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us and we really hope to see you uh, very soon with updates on, on this issue. Thank you so much and uh, everybody have a very nice evening. <laughs>
Thank you for the invitation. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. You. Lovely to be here today. See you. Bye-bye.